Hey everybody, welcome to uh, the September DEF CON 864 group meeting. We've got a lively show planned for us tonight. I'm going to turn this into some kind of late night meeting. <laughs> we need a band. <laughs> it does, it feels so good to get together and actually see human faces in a room, especially with DEF CON, because it's been so long since we all gathered together. Glad you guys are here and uh, continuing to help grow that hacker community here in Greenville. I really want to see that grow. Thanks for being a part of it. Without further ado, David, I'm going to pass it over to you and take it away, sir. Uh, my name is David Hyvolpe. I don't know if I'm known as anything. Uh, probably known as a lot of different things. Some of them good, some of them bad. But uh, I'm currently a software architect at a financial tech startup. Um, but I've spent time as a security engineer, um, as a manager of a security team. Um, and that's kind of where the idea for Red Pill came, is, is during that time. Tr trying, to, trying to bridge the gap between engineering and the C-level and then ultimately the board level. Um, communicating risk effectively. Hey, thanks for the invite. I'm going to start off by just giving a little DEF CON story time. Um, uh, I've never been to this local DEF CON chapter before, um, but I've been to uh, DEF CON 27, and I sort of attended 28, although safe mode was, yeah, it's not the same. DEF CON's all about people. Um, and so um, for those of you who haven't been, I, I want to strongly encourage uh, any desire you have to go, uh, go. Um, if 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 you need help uh, communicating to your bosses why it's important, uh, send them my way, and I'll 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 do what I can. Um, but you know, I can I can say uh, from a corporate security standpoint, it was uh, hugely impactful in a positive way um, for my team. I took one person from one engineer from my team, and uh, actually the senior um, sysadmin. Uh, to DEF CON 27. And, you know, we, we were all full of uh, grand ideas about what talks we would go to, and we had it all mapped out, and uh, that was all, that was all uh, silliness. Um, the, talks, the talks are cool, but LionCon is not where it's at. And um, for the most part, you're going to be sitting in LionCon if you want to go to talk, so don't worry about that. Um, go for the other things. Go for the people. Go for the villages. Go for uh, BadgeCon. Um, and that, I want to give a little story on BadgeCon. Um, I got there, and we're sitting in LionCon, and it was awful. And we're like, this is a, there's no way we're getting into these talks. Um, so we saw this guy wandering around, and he seemed to have a mission. So we kind of walked over him to see what his mission was. And he happened to be like a mayor from New York or something. And uh, also um, worked with uh, CIS. Um, and so he's the rare, the super rare breed of politician that actually can communicate intelligently um, about technical topics. Um, so I thought, yeah, yeah, this is a win. So we started kind of, he invited us to kind of come with him on his badge journey that he was going on. So, you know, we had gotten the badges. Um, if there were a video, I'd show you, but um, the DEF CON 27 badge was like this cool uh, quartz thing. Uh, and it had like a, a, a near field transmitter on the back. And it was like, it was pretty cool. Like we didn't know what they did at the time, um, but we knew if they put 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 two of them next to each other, they lit up and made some noises. And we spent hours trying to decipher what the the lights and the noises meant. Um, but that was kind of a waste of time. <laughs> we didn't know that at the time. Uh, so anyway, we we start following this guy around, and and we eventually uh, meet up with some other guys, and, and they were already dumping the firmware off of it, and um, they didn't know what to do with it though, because none of them were programmers. Um, so I started teaming up with them and we started reversing it. We ended up reversing it back to C. And of course it was a lot easier than, than what it was at the time to, to, you know, before when it was all in assembly, but, um, it's still not easy to, to figure out what a, oops, what a, um, uh, a, a disassembled, uh, recompiled or decompiled, sorry, uh, C code is, uh, but it was a lot of fun. And we eventually, you know, I, I figured out how the, the badge worked. From, from the code, and then we were able to create a chameleon badge that solved all the puzzles of the badge by putting like the chameleon badge next to any any badge, um, so you could just like win. So we we were the first squad to win. Um, <laughs> it was pretty great, um, and it was it was BadgeCon. And and as part of this, you know, my senior uh, security engineer learned to uh, take physical devices and dump firmware. And just like ask the questions. Um, that's the real, that's the thing, right? Ask the questions. And as soon as we went back to work, we started applying those skills 
dumping firmware from devices that we had in use, uh, a bunch of our customers had in use, and finding things that we hoped weren't there but were there. And, you know, it ended up being a huge win. Um, and, you know, I just, I strongly recommend it. And, and the biggest thing actually that came out of it was our sysadmin. His eyes were open. And from then on, security was a totally different game at, at our company because our main sysadmin was an ally and not an enemy. Um, so bring bring your favorite sysadmin. Maybe you'll uh, maybe you'll change the dynamic at work. Anyway, that's the end of my plug for going to DEF CON. Go to DEF CON. Just just do it. Okay. So like I said, I was uh, leading a security team. I had you know three people working with me. Um, Reported up to a CISO, he reports to the board, and I had a good working relationship with the CISO, and um, so we were talking a lot at a strategic level about, well, I, actually, let me back up a little bit. This security team, we started from nothing. Like, uh, I was the very first security resource um, under the CISO, and there was no previous history. We had no controls in place beyond basic AV, and it was it was bad. Um, so... We, we had a lot of strategic thinking to do. And um, my, my CISO asked the question, um, can we use quantitative methods to uh, get a handle on our risks as opposed to all these qualitative risk matrices, high, mediums, lows, all that. Um, and I have a background in um, statistics and simulation. I, I spent the first, I don't know, 10 years of my working life as a chemist. Uh, I did theory. so quantum theory and stat mech. And as part of that, like there's no real stat mech or quantum you can do anymore on paper. <laughs> so if you want to be, if you don't want to be a slave uh, to other people's code, you, you got to learn to code. So that's, that's actually how I learned to code. Um, I know I'm digressing here, but um, anyway, so I'm applying this background of uh, simulations and statistical analysis now to this new uh, field of, of cybersecurity that I was being indu in, inducted into. And, you know, I found that there was this really cool model out there uh, known as the MITRE attack framework. And they didn't usually talk about it as a model, which I found a little odd because in my life, in my past work, I would have called that a model, but they called it a framework. And I was like, okay, um, but it's, it's a model. And any model for a system can be turned into a simulation um, very directly. Um, and so I, I, there were a lot of sort of iterations in this process, but I eventually came about and created what is now Red Pill, which is an extension of the MITRE model into a Monte Carlo simulation. So, um, so let's see what the what's the proposal of Red Pill. The proposal of Red Pill is that using um, using this simulation, we could uh, maybe improve on how we measure the effectiveness of controls. Um, so right now, you know, it's, a, it's very qualitative. Um, I think we all have some pretty good intuition on, um, you know, which tools can stop which techniques. MITRE defines those, in fact, for us. Um, and, you know, we can, we can think about sort of some of the models, maybe the Lockheed Martin kill chain or the, the MITRE attack framework, and think about how um, uh, an attacker might move through an organization. And, and we can we can have some gut feeling of, of how effective certain controls are at maybe stopping them um, or slowing them down at least, or, you know, annoying them. Cause honestly, annoying them is one of the, the best things you can do um, when you're talking about financially motivated actors who are opportunistic to give them a hard time uh, and they, they'll go after easier targets. So, you know, anyway, digression. Um, so what else? Um, so like I said, uh, the mathematical methods that we're using here are not at all in any way new. These are hundreds of years old, um, and some 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 of the statistical methods, and then some of the uh, modeling uh, methods, the simulation methods, are you know 70, 70 years old. Uh, the main underlying um, premise for the simulation is um, from the, uh, Enrico Fermi and the development of the atomic bomb, where you know they, they figured out uh, that they could. Um, calculate statistically uh, the outcomes of some model um, by putting in random inputs into the model. Uh, and and okay. solitaire was actually what they um, started with. But anyway, um, 
So uh, I believe that if we use this model uh, in a um, in a simulation, that we can then deliver better insights into how the model functions. How does the MITRE ATT&CK framework work? Um, so at the end of the day, anyone who is employed in the cybersecurity industry, whether they know it or not, is a risk manager at some level. They're helping someone manage a risk somewhere. You know, if you're in security measurement, you're you're helping someone to assess um, maybe where their vulnerabilities are that they didn't know about. Um, and but at the end of the day, all of that goes back to some business who's in the job of making money somehow, and. Um, they're not hiring you to make them money unless you work for a professional service company. Um, they're hiring you to reduce the amount of money they might lose. So we're all in the business of managing risk. Um, and so uh, we might want to talk about how we can measure uh, risk. So um, right now, the common best practice is um, sort of risk matrices that everyone's familiar with. Um, and you categorize probability and impact, and usually impact is reasonably straightforward um, to estimate, and, and, and probability is generally less uh, easy. And, and ultimately, where it really all breaks down is when you're trying to think about how these various, um, let's say you're thinking about effectiveness of controls, how do the various likelihoods and probabilities of things uh, working against the control or being able to bypass the control, how do they all work together. What I mean is these are all, there's like a Bayesian filter here where, um, you know, this probability connects to this probability and, and you have to think about how the entire attack chain, let's say, works together um, from, from a control standpoint. If you, if you, you know, if you think about a control that protects, let's say your, your, your crown jewels, well, you know, that, that control may actually only see one attacker. In a, in a year um, because only one person got that far, hopefully. Um, whereas, you know, your controls on your edge, um, if you have an edge, uh, may see a, a lot more attackers. And so there's a there's a base probability difference. Um, and humans are not good at thinking about base probabilities and we're definitely not good about thinking about Bayesian statistics. Um, so that's where we need to offload this um, to humans. So, uh, sorry, offload this to simulation. So one of the key concepts here is um, when we're talking about measurement, uh, I think there's often some uh, confusion around what is a measurement. Um, I think a lot of people think of measurement as finding the truth or like the true value of something or like how many of something there is or whatever. And, and there's no such thing in reality. Like I, I'm kind of getting deep physically here, but at the very deepest levels of our physical reality, there is no such thing as like a precise anything like everything is uncertain. So the position of something is actually deeply physically uncertain and it's not about our ability to measure. And it's not like we have like, just don't have good enough tools and someday we'll be able to measure it. There's deep uncertainty. And um, so in science, you learn that like any measurement you make has to be accompanied by some level of uncertainty. Um, and, and there's, this is a key thing to understand, I think, in, in trying to measure risk, because um, I think we get paralyzed when we're trying to make the jump from qualitative to quantitative in, in this idea that I have to know what the exact answer is, and I, I don't have enough data, so I can't come up with a quantitative estimate, and, and therefore I just won't. I'll just stick with my qualitative estimates. Um, but I, I say that's, that's fooey. So like, you don't need to come up with the answer. There's no such thing as the answer there's a range of, of possibility and you don't need to say what the answer is. You need to say, how certain are you about certain values? Um, you just, you just need to say a range over which the, the, the real value is likely to fall. Um, and if you can do that for, for a number of fairly simple, um, inputs, then you can generate the inputs required to, um, allow the MITRE attack framework to work as a model for you and then allow red pill as a simulation of that model to, to generate a uh, useful output. So, um, that's, that's a key thing to understand is that in, in making that jump from qualitative to quantitative, you're, 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 you're not trying to find the real answer. There's no such thing. You're trying to reduce your uncertainty around what the answer could be. 
Okay, so the simulation itself is a Monte Carlo simulation. I kind of made a digression about Monte Carlo a little bit ago. <laughs> but uh, Monte Carlo uh, is um, basically a, it's a technique for um, putting random inputs into a simulation to that matches a pro the proper uh, probability distribution um, for a problem. And then the running through a series of um, steps that a model defines, like in this case, the steps would be, okay, we simulate an attacker. The attacker has some distribution of known skills. Um, and he goes through uh, an environment that has certain controls. And as he moves through the environment trying to perform these known skills, um, there's a probability of success or failure. And after you do, you know, hundreds of thousands of agents, you get statistics out of the end that uh, are a numerical and uh, numerical approximation of the true solution. Um, and it can be arbitrarily good uh, because you can just run more and more agents. Um, so everyone here knows MITRE ATT&CK, I assume. Um, what you may not know is the cyber threat uh, intelligence repository that lives behind it. There's a um, really cool database on GitHub uh, that has a lot of relational information between techniques, mitigation, data sources, um, uh, threat groups, and software. And it contains enough information that you can pull out based on the data that MITRE's looked at, which is known real breach data, um, how common various techniques are in use by APTs and how commonly they are used by software separately. Um, and that is key information that Red Pill uses to basically train its attackers on how a real world attacker, uh, what skills the real world attacker may have. Um, so our, our probability distribution matches the probability distribution found in the CTI. Um, but interestingly, MITRE doesn't really talk about that data very much, um, but yeah, who knows? So, uh, I've already kind of talked about this, but basically we take um, data that MITRE has, and they put a lot of effort into making that data clean. Um, and then we use valid models. Like I said, this this modeling that we're doing, this, this simulation technique that we're using is used in every industry. I mean, every mature industry uses physics, chemistry, uh, you know, oil and gas mining, uh, healthcare, the military, I mean, everyone does this. Uh, cybersecurity is a, still a fairly new field, and I think that's why we haven't seen much penetration um, of simulation techniques uh, into our industry, but it's coming. It is absolutely coming because the insurance companies will drive it. Um, every company is going to start looking seriously if they haven't already at cyber insurance. And the cyber insurance companies will want to be able to calculate your risk quantitatively. This, this will drive um, adoption of simulation. All right, so <clears throat> humans are reasonably good at intuiting likelihood of a particular uh, succinctly defined event. So, um, you know, how, how likely is it that you're going to catch a red light on your way home? maybe a particular red light. You know, you, you could probably give me, given the fact that you've done it, you've driven, the, driven home from work, you know, a thousand times, probably give me a reasonable range uh, of estimate of, of, of that event. But if I instead said, okay, um, on your entire pathway home, uh, calculate the total number of minutes that you're going to spend in red lights, assuming you have a reasonably long path home with a lot of red lights, um, that becomes a very difficult problem to do uh, you probably could still do it, um, but now imagine there's uh, thousands of paths and thousands of different lights that have 100 different colors each, and, you know, I'm trying to ask you to calculate the number of shades of colors that you interacted with. I mean, like, it becomes uh, essentially working your way through the MITRE ATT&CK framework, um, it becomes a very uh, impossible challenge for a human to estimate the likelihood of someone making it through each of the tactics necessary in the kill chain to reach some end target. Um, but if we can define the likelihoods of each individual event, we can let the computer do all the, the rest of the work. And the mathematical uh, underpinnings of that 
um, translate transition are, are well established and are not in question. Um, so I have a second. So that was the first part. The second part is um, how does the actual how does the simulation work in more detail? Um, and then I have a little a little demo um, that hopefully makes clear why you know I think Red Pill or something like it because I I don't have any claim to unique uh, uh, ability to make these kinds of simulations. So um, if it's not my simulation, it's going to be somebody's simulation. Um, anyway, let me put this in presenter mode. Cool. All right. So uh, the way you use Red Pill is um, you define your business environment first. So this would be like, let's say a very simple company. I've got a user land. I've got uh, you know people with laptops, maybe mobile devices, whatever. Um, some kind of user environment, and then there's some kind of segmentation between my user environment and my server environment. Maybe uh, it's in the types of credentials, like maybe my regularly credentialed users don't have access to the server environment. Um, maybe it requires some kind of you know special permission, whatever. Um, maybe there's a firewall. There's some solid segmentation of some kind between my user environment and my server environment. Um, so in, in red pill language, that would be considered two environments. And we're going to model each of them separately, but they're going to have to talk to each other. So um, the the inputs that the user would define are, okay, I have a user land, and yes, I have a server land. There's a certain set of environments currently modeled in Red Pill, but it's very easy to add other environments. So like right now, I'm modeling retail environments, user environment, server environment, um, but you, you, you could come up with some uh, like an industrial control environment or something that you want to model. Um, of course, then you would need the MITRE industrial control uh, attack framework. But um, anyway, so for each of those environments, you then want to collect data on your mitigations and your controls. Um, so this is kind of, this is the most, uh, this is the heaviest lift for using the simulation effectively, is getting good data on what mitigations you have in place and to what uh, effectiveness have you implemented them. Um, so this is where uh, it's going to require someone with expertise in cybersecurity to do an assessment. Whether that's someone coming from external or someone internal doing a self-assessment, um, this is this is the heavy lift. So you need to go through, you can you can go through all the mitigations. There's, I think, 41 or 42 in MITRE. Um, or you could just go through, like, the top 10. Um, I might put up on the, the GitHub page what, what the top 10 are um, and a little bit about how I calculate the top 10. But, you know, you don't have to put in data for every mitigation. Just pick the mitigations that uh, are important or the ones you know about in your environment. Um, and then same for um, data sources. So this says mitigations and controls. It should say mitigations and data sources. Um, your data sources are what are you actively um, ingesting data on in your environment and alerting on. Or monitoring in some active capacity that, um, because the simulation is going to say, okay, uh, an attacker did X, X is detectable by Y data source. Is my environment monitoring that data source? If so, to what extent? And then it'll calculate some probability that that activity was detectable. And um, then there's a sort of simulated incident response that happens in the background and uh, the defenders have a chance to try to sort of catch, kick out the attacker. Um, okay, so define the business environment. So I've got a user land, server land, say, uh, define the mitigations. So these are, well, I don't mean define the mitigations, defined by MITRE, but uh, uh, assess the implementation uh, quality of the MITRE mitigations and uh, the data sources, and then run it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then what you get is well you get a lot this is this is only one thing that you get you get an estimated range of effectiveness for each of your controls so um, we're going to go through a little demo and so a lot of this will make more sense hopefully but um, yeah you get you get some understanding of how each of your controls is doing specifically um, against different types of attackers because you can model 
financially motivated actors. You can model a red teamer. You can model, um, you know, a targeted nation state, an opportunistic nation state. I've got a modeling there for script kitties. Um, all of that's user configurable. Um, anyway, uh, you get an indication of, you know, how many detections did each of your controls actually contribute or how many blocks did they contribute? Um, and this way, this is kind of the first steps towards calculating um, ROI. Um, so, you know, like I said, we're all risk managers at the end of the day. We're trying to help someone on a board or some executive make a choice about how to expend limited resources. There's limited time for a security team. There's limited amount of money to spend. And if we want to make defenders win against attackers, we have to help defenders spend their time and their resources as effectively as possible. Um, and so that, that's what Red Pill aims to do. Um, so, a picture doesn't, whatever. Um, it's used for a lot of other things. Um, you know, it can be used for single variant analysis. So let's say you want to like, you're evaluating, you know, this year, you're doing the budget, let's say, and you're evaluating what, what security control do we want to add next year? You know, we've got budget and we've got manpower maybe to do um, some kind of widespread, you know, sim on our servers, or maybe we can do, um, I don't know, a packet capture. And we want to know, okay, we know how much that's going to cost. We've estimated how much that's going to cost. How much security ROI, how much risk mitigation are we going to get from that? Um, Red Pill can give you a range, an estimated range on what you should expect to, uh, how you should impact your risk. Um, let's see, uh, you can get, so, Red Pill itself calculates probabilities. It does not calculate uh, impacts. Um, I have some, I've done a lot of work in calculating impacts, um, and I'd be happy to talk with anyone that wants to um, understand how to calculate impact better. Um, but Red Pill itself just, just calculates probabilities for each. It doesn't get into uh, uh, amount of damages, um, but it's the first step in calculating that. Um, so one of the things that Red Pill needs as an input is an estimate of uh, likely breach event. Um, like I said, I have ways that I can help you to calculate that uh, accurately, um, but it's just for sanity's sake and for Red Pill's sake, it's, it's two separate things. Um, Red Pill is focused on probabilities. Anyway, um, so the big thing that this could do, obviously, is be used to um, create a narrative for discussing security in a way that uh, C-level and board level uh, folks can, can get on board and understand. Um, you know, you can, you can now talk in terms of dollars. Um, you can talk in terms of relative strength of controls. Um, quantitative analysis allows you to, to do that where qualitative does not. Um, so I think that's enough with the presentations. Let's get on to the demo. Red Pill's uh, code that I banged out myself, and it's messy. Um, but I've written in C Sharp. It's all available on GitHub. Um, it basically has uh, sort of two main uh, classes. Um, MITRE is one class. Uh, well, it has many classes, but it's two main. Uh, I've, I've kind of grouped them into uh, files. Um, MITRE mostly deals with data itself, like ingesting um, the inputs and uh, the information from the framework itself. Um, and the uninterestingly named program.cs is um, most of the actual simulation itself. Um, it is a, um, like I said, it's a, it's a discrete time. For, for those of you who are in the simulation world, it's a discrete time uh, Monte Carlo simulation where events are Bernoulli distributed, <laughs> which means um, time is not like a concept really in the in simulation sense that there's not like a clock running as the simulation is playing out. Each action that some agent takes exists sort of in its own timeline and that has a certain amount of time associated with it. So you do a certain action, it, it costs you a certain amount of time to do that action. Um, so there is a concept of time, but the simulation itself does not like run on some kind of clock. Um, so it's discrete event. And then Bernoulli distributed is like, uh, you can think of it as like yes, no answers. Um, so basically an attacker attacks, tries to achieve a per certain tactic in the MITRE framework. 
Uh, there are certain controls that may stop him. Do they stop him? Yes or no? That's permanently distributed. Anyway. Um, okay, so what do you get when you run this? Um, let's see what happens if we try to do this. I'm just going to output the screen right now. Like I said, this is a messy prototype, so a lot of the output um, just like dumps to the screen. Um, so what it's doing right now is it's running through, I think I've got it set for like 10,000 agents, and it's running through, um, uh, I think it's simulating a retail environment. So basically the whole kill chain is in scope for a retail environment um, because our, our, our end target lives potentially in the retail environment, meaning the data we want to exfil. Um, so it's running through and it's, it's, it's doing each of the environments um, three, in this case, there's only one environment. It's doing that environment three times. Um, so it's doing it at the low end of the inputs uh, estimates that you put in, the high end, and also sort of the average. So you get um, a distribution in your results. Um, by distribution, I mean like this. Like what was the worst case? What's the likely case? What's the best case? Um, before we dive into that though, um, I'm going to show just like a really quick, this is kind of what I'm envisioning as far as this is kind of, okay, so this is like a, a simple audit, right? Like, do you have the thing or do you not? Um, and so some people are running their, their shops like in this way, they're compliance driven and they're like, okay, we have the thing, we don't have the thing, whatever. Um, that that's better than nothing. Um, in this case, like company B looks like they're doing a little bit worse than company A because they're not doing annual audit, but they, you know, they have a password policy, they have privilege account management, filtering network traffic, and they have AV. Okay, cool. Some basic controls. The next step, like in complexity, is to do a qualitative analysis, qualitative assessment. So um, if we do that, you know, between company A and company B, we now like have a slightly different view because we're like, okay, company B doesn't do an annual audit but they actually have good password policy and they have, you know, good privilege account management. So whereas company A like doesn't have good privilege account management, they have it, but it's like sitting in a box somewhere, right? Um, and their password policy like exists, but it says max characters are seven. <laughs> like you can't go above seven, like, <laughs> um, you know, so something terrible. So which company is actually better? Uh, it's, it's a little harder to tell maybe. Um, then you get like, okay, now let's, let's, let's do a qualitative, quantitative assessment. So, um, and this, this is kind of like the executive summary of like, this is, this is what it tells you at the end of the day, after some analysis, um, what's your breach probability per attacker and to what extent are your controls contributing to your defense? So we see here that like, yeah, company B didn't have any annual audit and annual audit's important. Like if we look at company A, like annual audit has a pretty good impact. Um, but having a well-implemented privilege account management is such a game changer and having good passwords is such a game changer that it just completely dwarfs anything from the audit. Like not having the audit just doesn't matter uh, relative to company A because pr privilege account credentials are so important um, to, to, to protect. Um, and, and this is where like quantitative analysis gives you like a very different view than qualitative analysis because here I'm looking at it and I'm like, yeah, I mean, I may be able to tell that, you know, okay, if you've got good privilege account management and password policy, you're probably doing better than these guys that have not that. But if you're just looking at like highs and lows in a matrix and, and this is super simplified, right? Like in real life, this is hundreds of items in a giant matrix. Um, it can be really hard to tell like what's worth more, like one high over here or a couple lows over here. Like it, it's really tricky. Um, but oftentimes, like when you do the actual quantitative analysis, you find that some of the controls are so much more valuable than other controls that it just blows, blows it away. Um, and that's what red pill is, is, is designed to help us. Cause like, I think we all could look at this and say like, yeah, privilege account management is going to be like super important, but there's a big difference between saying something super important and saying it's like, you know, 2.6 out of a total mitigation score of like 3.5 or whatever. Um, knowing that number is is huge especially to a decision maker um okay so a little bit deeper dive on like what actually comes out of this simulation so like i showed you a little bit the raw output is like pretty ugly um and i just realized that i didn't spin up my uh web server so i'm not be able to, and it takes forever to spin up. So I probably won't be able to show like the layer information. So um, MITRE has a navigator, tech navigator. 
and it has um, you can you can import custom layers into it. Um, and I've created uh, some output in Redpill where it out, it'll output the layers for you, um, and you can just throw those into the Attack Navigator. Um, maybe like while someone else is talking later, I'll spin that up, and we can maybe show it like at the end or something. But um, so anyway, you get to analyze um, in this like confidence interval, like how successful each of your um, your your mitigations were in terms of um, what I call block score. But basically, it's like the number of times the way you can think about this block score is like the number of times the average attacker will have trouble in their engagement because of the control. So like, you know, this company that didn't do a very good job implement, implementing privilege account management, like on average, you know, 40% of attackers will have, one way to think about this particular number is like, uh, on average, there's about 40% chance that an attacker may have some problem at some point in their engagement uh, because of the fact you're using privilege account management. Um, and this number can be above one, uh, be above one because, you know, let's look at like company uh, B. Company B is the one that like actually has good privilege account management. The number can be above one because privilege account management Stop the attacker at multiple points um, in his attempt to get to his target. Um, okay, so that's that's kind of the output uh, for this simple simulation. I didn't I didn't put detection in here, um, but what you would get was very similar. It's like um, you know how many of your detects came from these different sources, um, and then you have like this. This is like this is what you hand to you know your 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 CISO when you're like, hey, we really need to spend more money on X. Um, here's kind of here's your pitch. So, like I said, this number is an input, the average single loss expectancy. And anyone who wants to talk uh, with me more about how you can calculate that number, I can I can help. Um, but Red Pill does not calculate that number. Anyway, um, so that's an input. The other input here is how many attackers you expect. I'm working with uh, some folks on how to get a good calculation for that number. Um, right now that's an input, but soon it will not be. Um, soon it will be something that's calculated based on your digital footprint uh, in various different ways. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so if we know the probability that a single attacker will breach you and we know the likelihood of a serious attacker uh, interacting with your organization, um, then we can calculate the annual single breach probability. If we know what you uh, what your expected loss for a single breach event is, we can then calculate your expected annual loss. Um, and we can also calculate what your loss would be if you didn't have a security program, or if you didn't have a particular control in your security program, or if your response time SLA was you know increased by four hours. Whatever you want to analyze, you can analyze and say, what would be the difference in my expected loss, my expected risk? And, and that is the return that you get from having that. Now, of course, the other piece of information that's not in here that you would want to include is how much does this thing cost, right? So I, haven't, I have no cost calculations in here right now. So you could, but you could very easily add, you know, okay, this, this control costs me half a full-time employee to run and $50,000 a year in annual licensing, and then plug that in here and, and really get your, you know, return on a control. And maybe some controls need to go away. And that money needs to be reallocated to different controls. And that, that's the point. That's why it's called red pill. Um, you may have a pet control that you really like. And it may might not be doing as much as you think it is. And you maybe need to readjust uh, how you're thinking. Um, that's, that's the red pill. Anyway, uh, the, other, the other like things here are kind of, this is like the percentage of attackers that are remaining at each stage. So you'll notice here that the biggest drop is from outside the organization to gaining initial access. 50% um, roughly of the attackers failed to gain initial access. And this um, you don't see as much uh, in, a, in a red team uh, type engagement, but in a real life engagement, um, you'll see this, this number is actually in a real life engagement very low, right? So um, in, in, in a real life, so again, this, this simulation I ran is for a very simplified um, organization. This is company B. So company B has only these controls in place. And they're not all fully implemented. Um, there's 41 controls. So there's there's a whole number of controls we're missing here. So the actual, these probabilities are overinflated, right? 
the actual probability that a, a financially motivated actor who's opportunistic and looking for the low-hanging fruit is going to uh, penetrate a company with sort of an average level of security is in the few percentile, which is why not every company gets breached every year, right? There's But, but the red teams are beating them every year <laughs> because the red teamers, um, they can use multiple techniques against a single target because they're targeting an organization, whereas a uh, opportunistic financially motivated actor is using maybe one technique against 50 different organizations or, or whatever, however they're selecting their targets. Anyway, I just wanted to point out why there's like this big uh, jump there. Um, and you can model red teamers as well. I, I have that in there. Uh, and a red teamer would not have a 50% reduction there because they're going to use multiple initial access techniques. Um, and I think that's that's the majority of what I have. Um, would would happily field any any questions. Um, yeah, appreciate your time. You said you're working with someone to gain the, a better understanding of the actual number of attackers that would be coming against the organization. Yep. Yeah. So I, I have a theory that you could calculate at least a first order approximation of the number of attackers to expect um, based on digital footprint. So um, the way I get there is I think about okay, how would I if I if I were financially motivated. Um, attack organizations, how would I go about selecting my targets? Um, I would probably use something like Recon and G and figure out, you know, how many identities, digital identities can I get on a company? Like, how many email addresses can I can I grab? And, and then I would just create automation to apply different attacks to that group, that body of, of identities that I've collected. So the more identities that a company has out there, the more email addresses, let's say, that they have publicly available, um, the higher, the larger number of financially motivated actors are likely to hit their organization. It's my theory, and and not just and not just the number of financially motivated actor, motivated actors, but the number of unique attacks against the organization from maybe even the same actor over and over again, right? Because he's he's created some automation and he's hitting all thousand of your your accounts that are out there. Um, so that's one that's one angle to it. I think there's another angle to it for more targeted attackers, and that angle is. Um, how valuable are your crown jewels? Um, I think there are some subset of attackers that are targeted in their attacks, and they have some information on the, the crown jewels that they're going after. And so um, modeling the number of attackers based on the value of your crown jewels, I think, is also going to be part of that, that calculation. That's going to be really helpful. How long have you been working on this? Uh, the, first, the first iteration of this was a spreadsheet uh, probably... I want to say a year ago. I have a terrible memory, so I don't know. I think about a year ago. But but the idea of it is about two and a half years old. Um, at that time, it wasn't living on the MITRE model yet. It was just an idea that if we had a model, mm -hmm. we could do something like this. But So it's basically like an actuarial table for cybersecurity? Yes. Yeah. Um, actually, I have, I have other data. Something that's a little bit more like that. Let's see, Monte Carlo. So, this is not actually red pill, but this is one of the ways you can calculate like loss. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So the 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 distribution of likely um, breach events is actually follows a um, a log normal distribution, mm -hmm. um, and so you see these like big big long long tail uh, risks. And this is what terrifies uh, insurance companies, by the way. This is what they want to understand. Because not most risks do not work this way. Uh, there are very few risks that work this way. And it's usually when there's a um, connection between failure events where one failure event will lead to another failure event. Um, that's where you, got, you start to see things that behave in this way. Um, but like I said, if you want to um, understand how we can calculate the value of, let's say, a record, because like, um, you know, I can, I can with pretty good certainty, if you tell me your vertical and your country and your type of record, I can, and the number of records in a breach, I can pretty accurately estimate the cost of each of those records and, and therefore the total cost of your breach. Um, and I have, and I can include things like, um, or not include more importantly, things like GDPR and, um, uh, 
reputational impact because a lot of these things like reputational impact don't get borne out. You know, Ponemon talks about them, but if you look at like actual balance sheets, very fuzzy. yeah, it, there's no there's no actual write down for these things. So importantly, like the data that I have, you can you can filter that what I call like weak garbage out um, and get to the hard costs. You know, the the litigation costs, the the cleanup costs, um, the IR the IR costs, like you know the real costs. Um, but anyway, is that yeah. cool? So that's like something like that is where this number would come from. So could this be used in the reverse instead of it being a blue team way of helping the business see its best dollar for impact? Could it be used on the converse as a red teamer to say what's the best attack path in, a, in an organization? Yeah, yeah, but I would assume most red teamers. Um, wouldn't probably be their playbook that they normally run off of. Probably, yeah. Um, but also, they they probably aren't being given this information by their customer. I would think, like, um, but you certainly could if you had a customer that's willing to share that much um, before your engagement. You could plan out an engagement based on what con what controls they have in place, and this would absolutely tell you. And and one of the layers I output to the attack navigator is what your most likely success path is um, as an attacker. I will say it makes me wonder if it would actually calm their nerves and as far as scope. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well one of the things. Report too, though, you've got your list of stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, think about this. A lot of the, um, like, C2 uh, software out there that, that people are using, like, uh, like Cobalt Strike or whatever, yeah. automatically generates uh, MITRE map output from your what you did like it, it tracks what you did and it, it automatically maps and it creates a finding report with miter so some with something like that you could tack on red pill to that pretty easily and you could even and i i'm thinking of ways to do this right now i i haven't validated them but you could potentially attach dollar amounts to findings and say like you know you had this much uncertainty about your controls effectiveness before and now, based on the new finding, your uncertainty is less, but it's less towards the bottom range of your uncertainty. So we're more certain that you're worse off than you were. Yeah. And therefore, that represents some change in the simulation output. And so we could potentially attach a dollar amount to a finding and say, this finding indicates that your risk is you know, $100,000 higher than you thought it was. Congrats. You could also play into joining late, but I've been watching the whole time. Um, a company does suffer an incident, and the incident was related to the direct area where they were weak in their controls. That gives the insurance company or whomever, you know, the agency to be able to say this was a, an area that was quantifiable ultimately, uh, and it was not addressed. Hence, you will be fined, not waived. Yeah, something seen on your stock audit number. Yeah. Period so, of time. Yeah. Is there a baseline for certain high-level uh, data? So, say you had like soft PI on four hundred thousand people. Yep. Is there a is there a dollar figure somewhere that's like a industry accepted? This is how much per. Um, I don't know. If there's an industry accepted value, and the value absolutely depends on the number of records. Sure. So you know, if you have if you have a thousand records breached, the cost per record is astronomically different. It's actually a power law distribution. Um, and uh, so yeah, if you have like ten thousand records of the same record type versus a thousand records, the cost per record is vastly different. Mm -hmm. So and usually you point that to your law department and say you got to give us the oh sure well some way shape or form. yeah. Um, but but I, given that uh, Monte Carlo spreadsheet I was showing, that that's what, how I compute that um, this yeah. this thing. And the data behind this thing is um, is all Ponemon. And before you go, oh no, Ponemon, I do filter out all the garbage that Ponemon puts in there, like um, um, a loss in in reputation and all that shenanigans. So it's it's the hard dollar. And in fact, it's a it's a thing I can turn on. Like, if you want to like really ramp up the FUD, you can turn those on. But <laughs> if you turn on GDPR, it gets crazy.